take us back to the cycling work plan after that. So we're going to go back to that just like we know that. And um, it's possible, likely, that we will finish the work earlier today. So that's the plan for the rest of the afternoon. We're on the final countdown. And great, you're on. I think I'll try to do this without a microphone because I'm, I'm not good at multitasking. Can everybody hear me okay? If not, just wave and I'll, I'll start using a microphone. Um, well, it's a pleasure to give you a, a brief update on the activities on the Interagency Aggressive Air Study Team this year. Um, we had quite a, quite a busy year, as you'll see. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, all our study team members from the eight uh, agencies that, uh, that are members of our, our group, uh, the, the federal, state, and tribal agencies. Um, as you know, we, we are a pretty tight team. We, we work very well together, and I hope that's uh, reflected here in the, in the quality of the, the science that we can present. A quick overview of um, what I hope to accomplish uh, on behalf of the study team here. Um, essentially, in the beginning, I'll, I'll basically cover the, the three recovery criteria for the Yellowstone ecosystem that are related to uh, population estimates and trend, uh, mortality and uh, mortality rates, occupancy uh, by females with offspring, and then I'll uh, give you a brief update on our known fate monitoring and uh, a uh, genetic monitoring project that we uh, just recently finished, and, uh, and I'll also have a quick update on, um, on some work that we started as part of the, the food synthesis project that you might remember from a couple of years ago that uh, we got published recently as well. Some results are still preliminary, so please keep that in mind. We try to indicate that um, wherever possible, but not everything in, in here is completely final yet. I think it's uh, always important to briefly review some boundaries because they are really critical to understanding some of the numbers and what area they actually come from. So we'll start off with, uh, as a reference, uh, national park areas. Um, Yellowstone National Park and Red Teton, of course, with Yellowstone National Park historically being really the core uh, area for the population. Then we have in blue the, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Recovery Zone that was established back in 1982. And then most important is really what we, uh, we, we call the demographic monitoring area. So this is the area within which we monitor uh, population trend mortalities, everything uh, for this population. That area is, um, is about 50,000 square kilometers. So it's a, it's a large area and um, it's, it's about stretches us to the limit in terms of what we can actually reasonably monitor as a study team. Just for reference, uh, most updated occupied range map. This is based on um, technique developed by uh, Dan Bjornley and co-authors for Dan Bjornley with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Uh, so this is based on uh, about 15 years of, of data, last 15 years of data basically. Um, occupied range representing about 58,000 square kilometers. Including some areas, especially on the, on the eastern portion of the ecosystem that are actually beyond the demographic monitoring area. And by the way, that demographic monitoring area is essentially uh, representing um, suitable habitat. And beyond those areas, there's, there's really not much, the suitability of habitat is such that we don't expect a lot of resident animals to, to make a living there without a lot of confidence. So first, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, population trend and estimation. and a brief overview of, of how we get to some of these numbers. Um, our main segment that we're monitoring, the main population segment that we're monitoring uh, for this population is uh, females with cubs of the year. Um, obviously the most important segment of, of the population and also very recognizable. Um, and that's one reason that historically a lot of emphasis has been on, on this particular um, segment of the, of the population. So we, uh, we do annual counts of females with cubs of the year, and then we apply what we call a rule set based on um, work that uh, one of my predecessors, Dick Knight, developed uh, er much earlier. And some of those criteria were really based on separating different observations of, of individuals, of females with cubs, 
uh, based on space criteria. So if two observations were very far apart, more than 30 kilometers in fact, then they would be deemed as coming from different family groups. If they were within that distance, they could not, they, the rule set would determine that they are not uh, separate family groups. That is a conservative rule set. And uh, we'll get, I'll show you a graph in, in a little while demonstrating from simulations how conservative that is. So we end up with a number, uh, with a count of unique family groups, females with curves of the deer. And by the way, um, just to prevent any confusion, when I say females with curves, I do mean females with curves of the year, uh, not with yearlings or two-year-olds. Once we have that count, we apply um, what we've referred to as the, the child two estimator. Most of you have seen these presentations before, have heard that term. And that's, what that estimator does is basically it's, a, it's accounting for the fact that some females with curves are more observable than other females. Um, so it, it, it accounts for this what we call uh, heterogeneity and citability. And it essentially allows us to estimate the number of individuals, the number of females with curves that we have not observed. Uh, you add that essentially to the number that we have observed and you come up with a Chow 2 estimate. Once we have those estimates, we then develop um, trend uh, models over time. We fit a linear and a quadratic model. And the whole purpose of that is to detect uh, a change in trend. So if a, if a linear trend in the population uh, suddenly has more support for a, a quadratic function, that means that the population is changing, uh, either increasing more or, or possibly decreasing or stabilizing. So in terms of our 2015 data um, from our we get a lot of observations from um, of females with curves um, and, and bears in general from observation flights. We um, have 54 aerial observation areas. We fly those twice a year. Um, and again, this, this is a pretty substantial effort, a lot of flight hours involved here. There's two units that, uh, that we have not flown yet. And the reason for that is that we, we don't have any evidence that there's any potential for females with curves in those areas yet, so we don't want to fly those yet when, um, and, and waste effort when, when it's not necessary. What you see, what you see here, these observations, uh, are the, the th 351 groups of bears that we observed from uh, observation flights, <coughs> representing uh, over 500 um, different bears, or 500 bear observations, not different bears. Um, of those, we have 43 observations of females with curves and uh, 36 observations of females with, uh, with older offspring. And just to address the, the critique that we've, um, we've had before, that some people have argued that uh, we see a change and increase in the, in the population estimate over time simply because we put more effort into um, our, our observation plots. And that is actually not true. Um, first of all, yes, we have we've had to add more flight hours over time, but that's simply because we've seen an expansion of the population over time. So as the population expanded, we expanded our, our flight area. So we're covering a lot more ground these days than two decades ago. And that's reflected in this slide. But if you look at just the recovery zone where we've monitored from the beginning, you see it's a pretty flat line. So there's no increase in effort. Uh, certainly, you know, if you look at this, in this area where, where we have surveyed the same area for a long time. In fact, the number of flight hours might have actually decreased a little bit within the recovery zone. In terms of sightings of females with curves, we had a total of 156, pretty equally divided among aerial and, and ground observations. So those are the the green symbols you, you see here. Then the next thing we go through is we try to identify unique family groups based on that rule set that I, that I just mentioned that Dick Knight developed. And each different color here is basically a different female with curves of the year. We also, from those observations, we get litter size. So it's basically two curves per, per female. Um, nothing unusual there. Litter sizes, we got 15 single cup litters, 18 twins, and 13 triplets. Uh, pretty normal distribution. And then, so that is for the entire ecosystem. Um, then we separate out those 
that are uh, outside, completely outside the, that demographic monitoring area, outside the DMA. And uh, there's, there's actually four individuals that had some observations outside the, the DMA, of which two were fully outside. So um, we basically have 44 unique family groups counted within the demographic monitoring area. I want to um, address one, one other critique that we've, uh, we've heard sometimes, is that, um, that there, there's bears moving outside, out of the, the core of the ecosystem. And some people have referred to that as the, the donut hole hypothesis. Um, and as a good scientist, you always come up with an alternative hypothesis. So I also have the Boston cream pie <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> And so I'm going to show you some graph and graphs and, and let you can tell which hypothesis is most supported. <coughs> and as you, if you look at, and again, we're looking at females with cubs of the year, uh, the, the, the most stable segment of the population. And, and let's see if they're leaving the core of the ecosystem. So we've got four decades of data here. And I think there's pretty strong support for the Boston Creek Pie hypothesis. A lot of good stuff in the middle, right? Um, this, is, this is where bears are. This is where females with cubs are. That is in, in the core of the system. Uh, are actually higher. You can just look at these numbers. So there's really not much support for the, the donut hole hypothesis. Uh, we've addressed this a couple of times, and I think this is the last time. We'll address that particular issue. So back to, to the estimate. Um, we have 44 unique females with cubs in the demographic monitoring area. Then we apply that child 2 estimator. In this case, because we had a lot of sightings over and over of the same individuals, it only added um, two individuals, 46 based on the child 2 estimator. And then we, we do that trend modeling where we let the, the current estimate be informed by what happens, what's happened in previous years. Um, and the reason for that is if, if you look at a graph like this, you see the raw estimates of the child 2 estimator, there's quite a bit of variation in it. You know, that gray line varies a lot. And that's simply uh, a reflection of, of sampling variation and, and things like that. Um, some, some other factors that, that, that just play a role here uh, when sampling while populations like uh, like grizzly bears and hills. So we fit uh, trend models to that and this, that's what this model average blue line is referring to. So that is a combination of a, of a linear and a quadratic model. I won't go into the details of that, but it allows us to, to, to test if there is a change occurring in, in the population trend, which is what we're most interested in. We're actually less interested in a particular population estimate. What matters to us is a change in trend. So that number, then, if you look at the, if you use the trend information, uh, that number comes out at 56 females with, uh, with cubs of the year. Then we derive a total population estimate from that um, by using that, that number of uh, the model average child 2 of 56, and we apply uh, viral rates that we've observed in the most recent decade, and. Uh, and use the age structure of different populations, assuming a stable age distribution to actually estimate different population segments. And when you apply that, that number uh, to the different population segments, this is what we get. Uh, let's pay most attention to the actual point estimates um, because the sex ratio is one to one right now. Um, we have of independent age females that are <coughs> two years or older, we have an estimate of 246. Uh, equal number of independent age males, 246, and then we also estimate dependent young cubs and yearlings uh, based on, on that estimate. That comes out at a total of 717. That is three more than we reported at the YES meeting. Uh, that's because we had an additional observation that, uh, that came in late. That we had to redo all our numbers and it added three bears to the population. So uh, the previous number of 714, which we indicated at the YES meeting was preliminary, uh, is now 714. Uh, 717, so we've gone uh, from 714 at the S meeting to 717 here. Um, this is hopefully the last estimate that we'll give you, but there's, there's always a chance that another record comes in and uh, somewhat late, and we'll have to do it again. Note uh, 
confidence interval in here is about plus or minus 75 individuals on either end. And we consider that um, pretty good for studying a population that, like this that's, that has all kinds of challenges um, in terms of um, really getting, getting good estimates. One point I want to make, too, is that um, you know, the suggestion has been made that, that the population is entirely flat and possibly decreasing. Um, if we look at the total <coughs> population estimates derived from these numbers of females with cubs of the year, um, we have 717 here. But keep in mind that the estimate back in 2001 was only about 534. So even though we have seen a, a stabilization and slowing of population growth, because the population level is pretty high, it doesn't take much growth, one to two percent, to actually add about 180 animals to the population over that 15 year time, 14 year time frame. So um, that is, I think it's, it's really important point to keep in mind that we have still added animals in the, the demographic monitoring area. Now I mentioned earlier that the child 2 estimated is a conservative estimate. Um, and we, we've been aware of that and we've been telling the committee about that for a long time. Uh, but I want to show you this graph. Some of you remember seeing this uh, from before, I'm sure. But I want to show it to you again because um, it, is, it is very important that we, that we understand that, that this is a conservative estimator. Um, Chuck Swartz uh, and co-authors did some simulations back in 2008 and published on that. And basically, um, where you, if you have a child 2 estimate of, of 40, um, you want to be on this, this 45 degree uh, line and come down at, at 40 on the true number of females with curves in, in the system, right? That's a, that's a truly unbiased estimate. What we're actually finding in the simulation data, applying that rule set of, of, that Dick Knight developed, which is a conservative rule set, that as you have more and more females with cubs in the ecosystem, it makes it more and more difficult to separate out unique family groups. So what happens is that the real, the, the, based on the simulations, the, the rule, applying the rule set would actually put your observations right here. So the more animals you have in the, in the, in the demographic monitoring area, the more biased that the child 2 technique is. So we're actually, if we're, Right now, we're, we're about 56, uh, based on the child 2 estimator. That would, um, that would end up being a true number of females with curves of closer to 100. So the bias in this estimator is about 40 to 50 percent. And that is one reason that we have pursued um, new techniques in the past. Um, and many of you have heard of our Mark Resite estimator, uh, which is based on um, marking animals based on radio, radio telemetry, then reciting based on aerial observation, the, the aerial observation flies that we do twice a year. Um, when the pilots see a female with curves, they are instructed to check their, with their telemetry gear whether an animal is radio collared or not. And that ratio of, of collared versus uncollared individuals helps us to, to estimate um, the, the true number out there. And this technique um, was, you know, took, took a number of years and a bunch of workshops to develop that. Um, that was published in a statistical journal and it's uh, a very good technique that provides an unbiased estimate. However, the, the, because the sample sizes are relatively low, we don't have that many females with, with cubs out in the, in the system, certainly not that are actually mark, radio marked. So sample sizes are low, which was, results in uh, pretty high, pretty large confidence <coughs> intervals. So that's been a real challenge dealing with this technique. So we've, this, uh, this year we've focused on the ability of that technique to detect trends over time. And again, we're not so much focused on the actual estimate, which, which is less, much less biased and, and relatively unbiased with this technique. Uh, we're, we're interested in, in the ability of the technique to detect trends over time. So we've, uh, we've contracted with, uh, with uh, the math, math department, stats department at uh, MSU uh, to help us with that and, uh, and to determine what our ability is to detect trend, what is the power of the statistical technique to detect trend over time. Uh, that's still an ongoing study, but initial results are not terribly promising. 
um, unless we can really in increase sample size, which would mean marking a lot more females over time. And uh, that, that, that may not be within our capacity at, at this point. So this may be a technique that we may not pursue in the future. We may think of other techniques that, we, that might, um, might work better for this population. Um, these things will always be ongoing. We will always try to improve uh, population estimation as, as part of our uh, monitoring efforts. Moving on to uh, mortality and, and mortality rates. Um, these are the locations of mortalities in, uh, in 2015 so far. Um, it's possible that we, we still have a few coming in. I, I really don't expect that anymore at this point. Um, important to point out that uh, we had 49 total, um, uh, 59 total, of which 48 are actually inside the DMA and 11 are outside the DMA. So the ones that are outside the DMA are the ones here uh, that, that have a little circle around them. Um, a lot of these are, are human caused mortalities. There's a few natural and a few undetermined causes in there. These are the numbers basically summarized um, across different age and sex classes. Um, I'll focus immediately on, on what is inside the DMA because that's really the most, most relevant. Uh, for our assessment and so we have uh, mostly independent age bears those that, that are two years or older that are in this sample uh, we have about 16 uh, dependent age bears that, uh, that, that uh, had mortalities uh, for a total of, of 48 um, pretty typical of course that, that males tend to be more vulnerable to mortality than females it's uh, Pretty instructive, I think, to look at how mortality accumulates through the active season. Um, and what what we see here is, you know, we see a pretty typical pattern of, of if you add the number of mortalities by week, you see just gradually climbing up. And then once uh, once we hit uh, the, this period of hyperphagia, where bears are getting ready for hibernation, a lot more movements. It's also hunting seasons uh, for for ungulates. So those tend to that. that period tends to be the time where the, those mortalities accumulate a little bit faster. And you see here the, for 2015, this, this is the, the top year out of this uh, series that we're showing here. There's also somewhat of an indication that we might have two different uh, modes. You see a number of years where mortality is relatively low. Those years tend to be years with good food supplies, uh, whereas a, a year like this, I think uh, everyone would agree that in our ecosystem, our, you know, the food supply was was pretty low, and, uh, and I think that's that's what we see reflected in, in this, um, <coughs> in really in, in this entire pattern, but also in, in some of these other years. So it's almost like there's a dual mode, uh, with, which is very much tied to food availability. So we calculate um, a mortality rate based on on a population estimate for the year and, and the mortalities that we that we have observed. And I'll, I'll walk you through the process here. Um, so going back to, uh, let's look at the independent age females first. We have 247 of those. We documented within the DMA 10, 10 of those. Then we apply a statistical technique that allows us to uh, incorporate the number of unreported mortalities that, um, that we haven't been able to observe to get a total mortality estimate. So that adds essentially nine individuals to, the, to this number. So we have a, a total estimated mortality of, of fe independent age females of 19. That results in a 7.7% um, um, estimated mortality rate. And that is just one tenth of a percent higher than the, the, just what we consider the sustainable mortality for independent age females, which is 7.6%. For males, we basically have the same scenario. We end up uh, with a total estimated mortality of 29. That represents just under 12%, and that is uh, that is not exceeding the sustainable mortality rate of 15% that we've established for, for independent age males for this population. And then for <coughs> dependent young, uh, we don't calculate uh, uh, unreported mortality, but we end up with a total of, of 16 that represents 7.2%. Um, of, the, of that segment of the population. 
and that is below the sustainable mortality um, for, for that segment, which is also 7.6%, just like independent age females. So for only, at this point, uh, we're just slightly over on the independent age female mortality. In terms of the, the causes, uh, we're, it's always helpful to kind of put it in perspective from uh, for a previous year. And uh, compared with uh, 2014, the, the green bars are 2015, so you know, what definitely jumps out is uh, livestock related uh, incidents and uh, mortalities related to those uh, site conflicts and also um, a, a few hunting related mortalities. Um, especially these, these two are really um, different, quite different from last year. And the third recovery criterion is related to occupancy um, of, the, of 18 bear management units within the recovery zone on a, a six year running tally. Um, we basically see that um, we see good occupancy of females with offspring that includes yearlings and two, years old, two year olds in, uh, in most units. Um, and the, the lowest number of years that we've observed offspring is four years. So we've, we've observed females with offspring in any of these units for at least uh, four years. For most units, it's all six years, actually, the blue ones. Quick uh, overview of our known fate monitoring uh, based on uh, pretty intensive uh, capture work, of course. Uh, I guess there's a lot of valuable information. Uh, we had a total of 107 captures. Um, 36 of those were research captures. Those are the white dots that you see um, the red uh, squares are management captures, 71 of those. Uh, total individual bears was uh, 90, um, with you know, somewhat of a male bias that's, that's not too unusual. We probably have more males in our sample this year than, uh, than, than an average year. Um, but it's pretty amazing that we, we still have 64 animals that were never captured before. <coughs> And it's worthwhile to, to look at that over time. Um, so first of all, this dashed line shows the, the number of individuals that we've, we've captured this is since 1998. And you see, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty substantial number, certainly in the, in the last 10 years, five years or so. But what is uh, really quite amazing is if you look at this uh, solid blue line, it's stayed pretty steady. And that's indicating on average about 62% of the animals that we capture have never been handled before, never been captured before. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. This is for a population that would be on the verge of collapse or declining. This, this is simply not possible. This is not a piece of evidence that we have that this population is doing quite well. You cannot capture that high of a percentage of new individuals year after year after year. Unless it's very stable or, or uh, slightly increasing. In terms of actual uh, radio monitored individuals, um, this year we, we monitored a total of 103. Uh, we try to keep our sample of adult females uh, at least at 25, uh, hopefully a little bit higher. So we're, we're doing, we're, we were doing quite well uh, this year. Um, the, the higher we can get that number, the, you know, 28, the, the better. Um, currently we have 62 bears still on, on the air and we see the breakdown there of males and females. And there's a few that uh, always go missing that we, we end up searching for for a while. When we handle animals, it gives us a great opportunity to, to collect some uh, data on, on body condition. So we get body mass and, and things like that. But uh, we also uh, do um, body uh, bio impedance measurements to measure uh, percent body fat. And what you see here is, um, first of all, uh, females and, and, and males on the right. These blue dots uh, represent an average uh, of the time period 2000 to 2014. That's a typical pattern of, over the active season. You see that uh, body fat usually declines for both males and females in, in the beginning of the year and then steadily goes up um, as they get ready for, for hibernation. Um, the, the green, so the, for 2015, those are the, the, the green observations. I won't spend much time for females because we have a very low sample size there. There's not much of a pattern. But what was really interesting for males, what we see is a decline that went beyond the typical pattern. And that might be reflective of a, a poor food year. 
What is interesting though is that it seems that uh, at least the males caught up by the end of the season. So before they, they went into the den, um, their percent body fat, and again this, this is small sample sizes, but their percent body fat uh, seem to be closer to the, the longer term mean. So that to me is a very interesting phenomenon and might point to, to some resilience that, uh, that we might not have been aware of. We do a lot of genetic modeling, monitoring. I'll, I'll provide you a little more details on that, on that study that we, we did separately, but um, just to give you an update on this, uh, we haven't gotten our, our genetic data back yet from the 2014 uh, field sampling, uh, but up to this point through 2013, we have um, 853 uh, animals genotypes uh, with, uh, with 20 microsatellite markets, so it's, a, it's an incredible data set. And up to this point, uh, we have no genetic evidence of any um, ancestry from outside the Grady Yellowstone ecosystem yet in any of the individuals that we've genotyped. So just to summarize population status, um, the population estimate was uh, 717. Uh, we really don't see much of a change in, in long-term trend. Um, there's no evidence of bears leaving the, the core of the ecosystem. Interesting to note that about 20% of mortalities are now outside the, the DMA. Um, so that is that number seems to be uh, increasing over time. Um, we have quite a few livestock and site conflicts, and the mortality uh, limit was exceeded by basically one tenth of a percent for independent age females. I didn't go into our food monitoring that we also do. I, I, I gave a more detailed report uh, to the Yes Committee on that. Uh, but the summary of that is basically that we, we have kind of an, an average, a below average, um, quite a fine year. Uh, we have relatively low availability of uh, winter kill carcasses. Berry production seems to be low, that's, that's based on qualitative uh, information. And then uh, we also seem to have a pretty short season for uh, foraging on moth sites. Um, there were a lot of observations near moth sites, but we actually had uh, fewer observations of, of bears actively foraging on, on moths. We uh, plan to have our uh, 2015 annual report out, uh, hopefully by June of 2016. You can find it on our website. Uh, you can Google, just Google IGBSD and you'll find it. Um, this is the copy of our, our last year's report. And just a reminder that um, there's no, various numbers of population estimates that you see out and uh, thrown out in the media and such. Um, if you want the, the actual estimate, go to our website, go to our annual reports. That's where we report this information. That's what uh, any numbers really should be based on. That's, that's the information that's been vetted through the entire study team uh, and, and reviewed and, and verified. And the next topic uh, is to give you a brief overview of, um, of two papers that, uh, that we recently published that I think are, are very relevant uh, to this committee. Uh, the first one uh, is basically looking at a trend in, in uh, effective population size. So I'll talk about that a little bit first. That, uh, that was in collaboration with a geneticist at our center, the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center of the USGS, uh, Pauline Kamath. And this was really actually a, an idea that, uh, that Mark Harrelson came up with a long time ago. Um, and you know, we had this incredible sample of genotype grizzly bears from this ecosystem. For a lot of those, we have, we have their, their history. Um, based on, on capture information. We have age and sex, and with that you can actually you know, not only just do a population reconstruction, but you can also link the genetic information, uh, the parentage information, all the relationships among those individuals to that. So it's an it's a incredibly uh, rich data set um, that, that is also quite unique. And applying these some of these genetic techniques um, was really uh, a, a great application here for Yellowstone because um, typically when you, when you don't have an isolated population, you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, assumptions that you violate with these type of techniques because Yellowstone is an isolated population that actually helped apply these techniques. So the issue with, uh, you know, in terms of Yellowstone uh, genetics, is that the Yellowstone population has been isolated for, for quite some time. 
Uh, we also know that it uh, rel has relatively low genetic uh, diversity compared with other po populations. Mm -hmm. See a couple here um, from, from different parts of the, the range in Yellowstone is at the bottom. It's, it's not the lowest by any means, by the way. Um, the ABC islands in Alaska, for example, have a lower genetic diversity than, than the Yellowstone population. And you know, the, the Yellowstone population, that, again, the isolation is, is kind of shown here uh, based on some work that, that Mike Proctor did uh, a couple of years ago, a very comprehensive analysis. It definitely shows that, that uh, the, the genetic uh, fingerprint of the population is, is different from, from even an area as close as the southern uh, uh, continental divide ecosystem. Uh, which, which you see here. So that's kind of the background uh, genetically for this, for the population. And we looked at, um, for this analysis, we looked at a, a number of concepts that, uh, that we really um, thought would, would help inform our understanding of, of the, the genetic uh, situation uh, that, that we have now. So one concept, uh, first one is effective population size. That's essentially the number of individuals that are contributing genes to the next generation. There's also an important measure uh, called effective uh, number of breeders. That's really the, the number of breeding animals uh, contributing to a cohort. And then when we say cohort here, that's a, a three-year cohort for breeding bears. That's a reproductive cycle. Uh, generation interval, that's basically the average age of, of parents um, that are producing.